Well, John, we were too lazy to come up with our own predictions for 2021. What should we do? Well, let's steal some from Dr. Bob Kocher, who just published his top 10 predictions in Fortune magazine. You sly dog. Welcome to Care Talk, your holiday home for incisive debate about healthcare business and policy. I'm David Williams, president of Health Business Group. And I'm John Driscoll, the CEO of CareCentrics. Hey, John, our guest today is Bob Kocher, and he is a healthcare investor at Venrock and previously served in the Obama administration. He was one of the shapers of the Affordable Care Act. I was thinking about listing out all his accomplishments and affiliations, but we only have 20 minutes, so I'm just going to stop right there. Well, you forgot Alpine Ski Tester, but let's let's skip over that for the moment. Uh, Bob, you and Brian Roberts your partner at Venrock, shared your top 10 non-COVID predictions for 2021 in Fortune this month. So let's dig in. David? All right. So the first prediction was confidence, and then it said, and independence is restored in the CDC and the FDA. And I'm all for that. And I can see the independence and the competence, but isn't it going to take a little bit more than, uh, than that just to have confidence? I mean, people like us might have confidence, but you know, what about the general public? I think, first of all, uh, at FDA and CDC, that appointing leaders that come from science and who are great leaders and managers will um, add competence uh, and independence. I also think that um, confidence in vaccines and therapeutics and how we manage public health are going to come back pretty quickly, particularly with the data uh, that the FDA shared quite transparently on the vaccines being better than any of us thought it was going to be, and also every other country in the world doing it. And so you won't just have to trust the U.S. You'll be able to look all around the world and see what's happening. And I think that will give us more confidence, too. Uh, I think, actually, after we get through this dark period, people are going to start to feel a lot happier and a lot more confident about CDC and FDA. I don't know, Bob. I'm very nervous about how the erosion in expert advice may be kind of structural, given the politics. I, 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 I share your hope that the practical results of the vaccine versus being locked down or distanced or restricted will probably drive drive vaccine trial pretty darn quickly. But I do worry about the long tail of of, of distrust. And I and I and I and I think we're gonna have to earn that back over a longer period of time. I don't know what, what your perspective is on that. Let me share your long-term view. I mean, uh, how we've gone from reading peer-reviewed articles to now only reading excerpts on Twitter that, you know, people's confidence in science and also the rigor of the work, um, I think has been eroded over the last several years. And I'm not sure we're gonna go back to a period of 20 years ago where people sort of just bowed their heads and said, I trust the scientists. But um, I think it's important that we, have leadership that really listens to it, and and then also beyond COVID, that that we re-embrace science because we have a lot of problems that science can help us with, whether that's climate change or how to educate ourselves better or how to create a more safe and just society. And with advances in technology of both biologic and computer, we need science to help us. And in some of our predictions later, talk about some of the amazing things happening in science, and and I think that should give people confidence that actually, if we do turn to experts and, and, and benefit from their input, we can actually um, have things get better faster. Bob, you also um, claim that virtual care f at, for Medicare is going to continue to rapidly grow. And I, I'm a little bit skeptical about that, given the institutional pull of hospitals and doctors to see their patients in person. Do you, and, 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 and historically, there's been very little flexibility on the part of CMS around telemedicine. And there's been a lot of respect, probably too much respect given to the local jurisdictional limits to doctors practicing across different states. How, how, do you, how, do you, how does your prediction jive with the history of all of the barriers to telemedicine being put up by the, the incumbents? I, I, I share your hopes for telemedicine. I just, I'm not confident that uh, the medical industrial complex won't snap back. Well, this is one that I'm pretty confident in. But first, I would remind you that a year ago today, Medicare didn't cover telemedicine at all. So it's gone from zero to something. So, I mean, it, like the takeoff has at least um, happened thanks to COVID. Uh, and granted, Medicare is using, for the most part, the emergency authority under COVID to pay for this. But I think the reason why I feel so confident in this is that we had an ageist view of old people 
um, I believe, where there was a belief that Medicare beneficiaries couldn't use technology and didn't know how to use phones and wouldn't want to actually have a doctor check on them in their house that they like to go drive to the office and spend a half a day seeing a doctor. And with COVID, it was not only dangerous, but many offices were closed. And so many, many people for the first time experienced telemedicine. And one of our one of the companies that we're involved with, Doctor and a Man, launched in Medicare. And lo and behold, um, Medicare beneficiaries had the same net promoter scores as other people when they use telemedicine, which are very high. Uh, the care they receive is good. Uh, and for Medicare beneficiaries, the other cool thing about telemedicine is that you can check on them much more often. When I have people come see me in the office, we might have you come back once every, you know, once a week, maybe once every three weeks if you're, you know, but not, but not every day. And with telemedicine, I can do a five minute check in on somebody and see how they're doing. I can get their son or daughter on a, on the screen with me and talk to them too. There's a bunch of really cool ways you can use telemedicine to make care a lot better. And now that everybody in the country has tried it, uh, it's a lot easier to gain adoption. So that's going to drive a bunch of people to build businesses in this area, I think. Uh, and and while the brick and mortar system is going to want to use their buildings, um, there's just going to be a lot more choice. And even the brick and mortar place that I'm affiliated with, Stanford, you know, while we'll want you to come back, they they the idea that 10 to 20 percent of all visits are going to be virtual forever uh, going forward, which is like 10 to 10, 10 to 20 percent more than they had last year. You know, I think your number three and four were interesting. I kind of put them together. Four was about the Affordable Care Act. We're finally going to hear about it. You know, like we're not going to hear about it being repealed or, or attacked, and it's just going to be there. Uh, with number three was about having zero dollars out of pocket for for most people. And it's interesting because that's another way of looking at it. It's sort of effectively a Medicare or Medicaid for all or universal coverage if people have, you know, sort of zero dollar out of pocket. Do you see that becoming a, a new way of looking at things as opposed to kind of, you know, ACA? Uh, Medicare for all, free market? Is it just looking at it through the lens of what's the real friction? If you if you go to the point of care and you don't have to pay anything, that's sort of universal coverage if everybody has that. Yeah, I, I think that these semantic arguments we have about who finances healthcare and whether you call it Medicare for all or the current system that we have, um, people think about healthcare really from what they pay. Uh, and they pay for it most directly in what they pay when they go see a doctor and pick up a medicine. They don't really understand the combination of taxes and premiums and other things that they're paying. I actually think COVID was a turbocharger to the whole Mike Chernew, Mark Fendrick for 30 years idea of you know, value-based benefit design, that some things are so important, you need to make them free, and then maybe even give you incentives to do them. And public health, uh, COVID is you know, one way to make it free, which is in you know, the country right now, testing's free, vaccines are free, and antibody treatments are likely going to be free. And I think you'll see that happen for things like telemedicine going forward, that people will want you to talk to a nurse or doctor before you show up in an emergency room. I think you'll see it for even virtual specialty care because it will end up being a lot more efficient and, and cheaper. Uh, and I think Biden will end up in his ACA kind of bolstering efforts to say, sure, we need to bend the cost curve down. We have to address the Medicare trust fund someday. But right now we're in a recession with 10.4 million people uh, unemployed uh, we're trying to stimulate the economy. And the last thing I want to do is make it a barrier to get health care, particularly in a pandemic. And so I think you'll see, you know, additional subsidy dollars also put in uh, to help people with premiums and cost sharing in the ACA. Um, Medicare Advantage is booming. Uh, and that's going to lead the MA plans also to give it some even maybe even, you know, Part B give backs. And so that will, you know, be another way in which people get lower cost health care. Well, one of the things that that uh, that sounds like we agree on is how nursing home care can go virtual, and care to the home is obviously what CareCentric spends a lot of time enabling and supporting. But I guess the question I'd have is: you're sort of saying they're going out of business. Aren't there some cases that still need to go to some form of a nursing home? Absolutely. Um, it could have been number four. Um, so. When when I was a, a med student and resident, you know, one of the things that would happen every night I'd be on call is we would get patients coming in from nursing homes who were really sick and needed to come back into the hospital. Um, they would then go back to the nursing homes and sadly they'd come back again. And um, there are some patients who are really sick uh, and can't be safe at home. And I think they will continue to need to go to facilities with really skilled care. Um, the challenge is that there's a lot of other patients who go to those facilities um, and could go home already with really advances in remote patient monitoring and telemedicine, you can beam into their houses, you know, all kinds of clinicians to help oversee their care. You can monitor the vital signs in the same way as they are in nursing homes. And that will make the home, I think, much more feasible for a broader set of people. 
the home has benefits. Um, there's you know a lower risk of infection there. There's a lower risk of delirium in the home. That is terrifically that's better for patients. Uh, the food is often the food you're familiar with, so that that actually also could be a traditional recovery perspective. Uh, and I think what we're seeing is that nursing homes are having a really hard time creating the safety that you would want your loved one to experience in their in their care. Uh, and so that's going to push a lot of desire on the part of patients and plants uh, to have patients get care in the home. And so I I'm I think that actually um, we will have nursing homes. Some 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 will fail, um, but the ones who can deliver high acuity care skillfully, I think will will do okay. But many nursing homes not serving that higher acuity niche, uh, and those patients I think would be safer treated in their homes and, and better off. I think we're finding number five is your is your lucky number because last week we were talking about the top ten things from uh, twenty twenty, and I kind of sneaked in number five as drug pricing because I, I know that was a hot button issue for you, and I I have a feeling that Bob put this one as number five. Uh, for you because he knew you would enjoy talking about it. Strong agreement for me. <laughs> oh, sure. I mean, the U.S. healthcare is characterized by, you know, overutilization. Like in general, we use more of everything and not many barriers up to get care. Um, for reasons that don't make a heck of a lot of sense, uh, mental health care actually that you kind of can't get when you want it and need it. And health plans have made it really hard to get. Uh, and we've all seen in society the negative ramifications of you know, poorly treated and untreated mental health care conditions. And obviously it leads to a bunch of a bunch of bad things. It leads to homelessness, people losing their jobs, uh, people who have jobs making them less effective in their jobs, people who are sick, not, you know, being able to comply with whatever their proper treatment regimens would be. And the other thing that's really hard to hard to imagine is that in mental health, we we accept a much broader definition of what is acceptable treatment. Um, and in the rest of healthcare, there's you know evidence-based care and clinical guidelines and lots of peer review and oversight. In behavioral health care, honestly, almost anything goes. Uh, and that leads to a handful of people who are getting care to get care that's not effective. And we wouldn't tolerate that you know, in any other medical. Uh, and so what I have hope and excitement about is the fact that we're gonna see a lot more attention to mental health care and its importance, that will lead to a lot more um, oversight on the part of health plans and patients and, and people who refer them to make sure the care that they're getting is really effective to make sure that we get the ROI uh, that you'd like to get. Uh, and not surprisingly, um, when people get mental health care treatment, everything gets better in their lives. <laughs> like their jobs go better, their relationships go better, um, their other health care conditions go better. Uh, and the interventions we have for mental health care, the evidence-based ones, um, are actually as effective as small molecule medicines for a lot of other chronic diseases. So we have treatments that really work here. Uh, and what we've seen over the last year is a year where, you know, obvious that we just have to actually take this seriously and provide access between a pandemic, a recession, social justice riots, and an election. Like we've had a year of stress. Uh, that's exacerbated all these conditions. And thankfully, um, we've seen, you know, virtual care startups grow health plans actually begin saying, we're going to make this a, an important part of our benefit design. Um, I've had a couple of CEOs of large blue plans say, this is their top board priority for their health plans is actually to improve mental health care. Uh, and so I'm actually quite hopeful that we'll kind of reverse the Reagan era sort of decline of mental health care and sort of begin to actually build it back in. Um, certainly if you're a risk-based primary care doctor, um, you, you already know that mental health care is essential. And, you know, you see chin med hiring geriatric psychologists in all their offices. So like, I, I think that we're on the right path actually here. Well, I was going to say, John, I actually, I actually spoke with our censor and he said, if we talk about SPAC, the whole thing is probably going to get censored. So I'm, I'm going to skip right past the SPAC topic and on to seven about the mental health revolution. And Bob, you've noted that there's a mental health revolution underway and it's going to continue. Now, this, on the one hand, is is great, right? Because you, if you solve these, address these mental health issues, which are often the root cause of uh, why people are going to the doctor having other issues, it's going to be positive overall. But the the more uh, pessimistic part of me thinks that well, maybe it's just going to have you know more and more demand and spending on mental health, and we really won't get the ROI uh, broadly. It'll just be an added expense. But that doesn't seem to be what you think. But I think, at least for me, Bob, I see that as more evolution than revolution. And I still think we have a strong challenge around stigma. I see it with my own team of you know 2,000 people. It's still very hard for people to put up their hand and, and get help. And I think until we actually 
get the demand the the, the, the demand side right, um, I, I think it's going to be hard to get this even as we optimize supply to get it right. And I look at all of the challenges that my my fellow ex veterans who are who are really having a hard time. We've got this epidemic of loneliness. I think this is an evolution, not a revolution. I agree that there's 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 good news on the horizon on the supply side and on the thinking and rationally th thinking through what people need. But we're far away from from where people are really very comfortable entering the system in, unless they're in crisis. John, I'm a little more optimistic than you. Um, there's a company called We Are Health that I co-founded several years ago with David Eversman and Brian Roberts. And we serve, we provide mental health care services to large employers. Um, and it's the only company that I've ever worked with where when we launch at an employer, we always exceed the engagement expectations of the employer and normal earth two to 10 X more utilization than they had the prior year when people are offered access, you know, easy access to terrific care. And so now granted, these are employed populations, so it's not everybody. Uh, and many of these companies have younger, I think that stigma is a lot less pronounced um, now than it was even two or three years ago. I agree with you. We should keep working on it. So John, number eight is about IPOs and M and A, and I know that gets your juices flowing, in particular your your saliva. I can actually hear you salivating uh, into the microphone. So why don't you cover that one? Sure. Uh, well, you know, Teladoc Lavongo showed people what's possible uh, and created, you know, for the first time, you know, a very large newish company in this area, um, and also now Teladoc with the breadth of their product offering. Um, is causing everybody else to say, wait a minute, you know, should I get bigger now? Uh, do I need to combine to have an offering that's um, not a point solution? Uh, and the public markets couldn't be more receptive right now. Uh, and so, you know, do I need to go public tomorrow? And may I need to combine with somebody to have the revenue and predictability that I need to, to go public? And so I think you're gonna see lots and lots of activity. Um, and there's just a lot of capital right now looking um, for you know private companies and and uh, and so I think you're going to see just a lot of financings, mergers, acquisitions, IPOs, combinations uh, over the next many months. So Bob, I know it's a top ten list, but I think by the time you, you're getting to number nine, you're running out of steam because for number nine you predicted nothing and specifically no action on drug pricing. You know I, I think that while Biden you know has campaigned uh, a great deal on his desire to lower drug prices and and President Trump you know has been outspoken about drug prices and hoping to do most favorite nation. Uh, I think people are going to be so joyous about the fact that science has worked and we have created several seemingly super effective COVID vaccines this year uh, that people won't have the desire to go after drug companies and, and to do reference pricing. Um, there actually is action happening kind of behind the scenes. I mean, we're seeing companies when they launch drugs actually have lower price disparities between the U.S. and the rest of the world and in Europe in particular, because I think they're expecting that there could be most favored nation or, you know, reference pricing type methodologies. Uh, but I think actually people are going to sort of give, give pharma a pass this year. Ouch. Well, what, what, what do you think the impact will be of Amazon pharmacy, Bob? What, what's your, what's your, what's the perspective of Silicon Valley? So first, um, every year we basically say that, you know, Facebook, Google, and, you know, and Amazon and Microsoft are not going to be effective uh, in their healthcare businesses. And, you know, and, and we were last year predicting that Haven was going to have a rough year and, and they did. Um, the first thing that I've, the first thing I've seen in many years that these giant tech companies have done that's at least interesting and I think well conceived is the Amazon pharmacy. Um, I have tried it. And the onboarding experience was, you know, really intuitive and terrific. Um, Amazon has a lot of trust that they built in their users and um, confidence from being, you know, their prime delivery system. Uh, they began teaching us at Whole Foods how to use our prime, you know, codes for discounts. And actually for their pharmacy, they're using prime to allow you to get discounts and reach too. Uh, I think actually people are going to like it uh, and that it is going to grow. Uh, I think it's going to be better for people who have simple, you know, chronic disease meds, not biologics with lots of prior authorization steps. But I, I actually think this one's going to actually be an example of a big tech company building something that people like. Now, Bob, I have my uh, Amazon uh, Halo band and I, I waved it in front of my uh, Alexa the other day and then a whole crate of drugs showed up. So I think maybe the prediction's already even a little bit ahead of, you know, it's already being realized now. 
it's got to be bad news for the, the CVS and the Walgreens of the world. The terrestrial pharmacy experience couldn't be less interesting. And it's going to be fascinating to see how they, whether the Amazon can just teach them something about that, that customer experience, because it is dramatically different. Although they, when they bought Whole Foods, all of the grocers took a hit, but they seem to have recovered quite nicely. It's going to be fascinating to watch. I think it will make all of our experiences better because if you're the terrestrial pharmacy, um, <laughs> you're going to have to actually improve the experience and, and not have it be the usual one, which is you arrive to pick up your medicine and they say, we haven't started filling it yet. So I think it's going to be better. Well, Bob, we've really enjoyed going through your predictions here. Uh, one, because they're good. And two, because it saved uh, John and me the trouble of actually having to create our own predictions. So that was very, uh, very timely uh, and appreciated. I'm glad that uh, we didn't have time to predict a new plague or anything like that uh, coming along. So I think we're going to quit while, while we're ahead here. And I'm going to say thank you for listening to another edition of Care Talk. I'm David Williams, president of Health Business Group. And I'm John Driscoll, the CEO of Care Centrics. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob.